Microbrewer Podcast Session 36. Welcome to Microbrewer Podcast. Going deep to get inside the craft beer industry and inside the heads of people who work there. Here's your host, Nathan Pierce. Welcome to Microbrewer Podcast. We talk about everything craft beer related with a focus for people looking at starting their own microbrewery or wanting to take their existing brewery to the next level. I'm your host, Nathan Pierce, and thanks for listening. I want to remind you to please subscribe, rate, and review in iTunes or Stitcher if you haven't already. And there's some easy links, so you can find those just by going to microbrewer.com slash iTunes or microbrewer.com slash Stitcher. Also, there's a page on the Microbrewer website where you can support Microbrewer. It's microbrewer.com slash support microbrewer. There's some really easy ways. I think there's six different ways that you could support the show. Uh, Number five is there's a link and a banner into Amazon. So if you click on the link or the banner, and you go into Amazon and buy something, I think we get 4%. It doesn't add anything onto your purchase price, but that's a way to kind of offset some of the costs of running this show. And there's also, just below that, an option to buy me a beer. It's just it's just kind of a fun way. You can send some money through PayPal, so it's like, buy me a pint, buy me a growler, or fill my fridge for a week. If you don't feel comfortable sending money, go check out that page anyway. There's some other easier ways and sort of less committed ways that you can help keep this show on the air. It's microbrewer.com slash support microbrewer. I really appreciate that, guys. Thanks a lot. In this episode, I talk with Brian Kelly from Elevation 66 Brewing Company in El Cerrito, California. Elevation 66 is a gastropub in the East San Francisco Bay Area. I visited there a few weeks ago, and I was really impressed by their beer and their food. So I asked Brian if I could talk with them more and uh, put them on the show. And they're already getting ready to expand. So I asked Brian more specifically about writing a business plan for a brewery. So if you're at that stage, I hope this information helps. And you could go to the show notes for links and more resources about that. It's at microbrewer.com slash session 36. Here's the interview. Hey, Brian, I introduced you to the listeners. Let's take a few minutes and you could tell us more about you and your brewery. Uh, So Elevation 66 Brewing Company is located in El Cerrito, California in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, We opened September of 2011, so we've been open a little bit more than three years now. Um, when we started, we basically just had the goal of, uh, opening a nice local brew pub, um, for the people of the community, uh, to where they come get some quality craft beer and, um, some good food. Uh, this is a very local oriented spot. Um, it's had great support from the community around us here. Um, we don't do any distribution. We're not a, a, a brewery that distributes beer at this point. Um, all the beer is sold in house, but, uh, so far, everything has been great. Um, like I said, we've had great support from the community. Um, we try to focus on supporting the local community as far as sourcing food, um, uh, where, where we get a lot of our materials to run the place. Um, but, you know, it, it's just a nice local neighborhood pub that, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of neighborhoods need something like this, and we happen to find a, a good little niche in this community that we fit into pretty well. Well, I was there just a couple of weeks ago and and uh, met you then. I gotta say, the food is pretty good. Yeah, that was uh, that was definitely one of our focuses when we opened was to um, have a place where you could get good beer as well as good food. Uh, I think all too often you see, you know, you get great beer in spots, and their food is just uh, that's not their focus. So their food just kind of it's on the back burner uh, no pun intended um but it's just uh you know typical fried food and the brewery food which, which has its purpose but i think in the bay area and 
as time progresses um i think the market's looking for something a little bit more uh a little bit more quality basically um something that supports local farmers something that's seasonable uh seasonal something that's sustainable um and just good quality food that has some heart and some thought put into the dishes so that was something we really wanted to do a term that i heard is gastropub why yes. what is that why did you call your place a brew pub instead of a gastropub what's the difference um, I, you know, a brew pub is, is just any, any spot that has, uh, that brews their own beer that also serves food. Um, a gastro pub, uh, again, focuses a little bit more on quality food, um, and sustainability and seasonal foods. Um, you know, you, you see a couple gastro pubs around the Bay Area. You know, when I think gastro pub initially, uh, Magnolia Brewing Company in San Francisco definitely comes to mind. Um, they're kind of, you know, they've been doing it for a long time. They just focused on the quality of their food as well as the beer. And, um, you know, so, uh, that was, that's one spot that comes to mind initially, but that was, uh, you know, I, I think you're going to start to see more and more of these. I mean, uh, Mill, Mill Valley Beer Company is definitely a gastro pub and, and the more breweries that open, you're going to start to see people focus on, uh, on, on food that has, uh, that's a little bit higher end. Um, so that's, that's basically what we were going for. That's really when I was uh, planning to start my brewery over the past year or so, I was, um, planning on doing something. Well, it, I mean, I want to do a package brewery, but I think every brewery is pretty much got to have food nowadays. And I'm not really satisfied with kind of like deep fried sort of pub grub kind of stuff. And I was really stoked about what you guys have going on there. Thanks. 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 Do you consider yourself as part of the gastropub scene? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I'm pretty much the, sure that the definition of gastropub basically just, uh, you know, is a bar or restaurant that serves high end beer and food. Um, so I, I do consider our food to be high end. Um, you know, we won an award last year for best artisanal pub food in the East Bay. So I think when you win an award like that, you kind of, uh, by default have to throw yourself into that gastro pub qual- uh, category. And, uh, <laughs> so that was, that was pretty exciting for us, but yeah, our chefs, our chefs, uh, work really hard to create some, some unique dishes. And, um, so far we've had some great menus come out of this place. So, uh, yeah, I would definitely consider us a gastro pub for sure. I had the cod and crab cakes, which I thought were amazing. My girlfriend's allergic to gluten, so she couldn't have that. She had the uh, quinoa. Yes. And um, I was just reviewing your menu, and it says that it's warmed quinoa. It's not like a cold quinoa salad. Yes. I don't. I don't remember exactly the temperature in my mouth, but I remember it tasted really good. <laughs> yeah. The this quinoa dish is nice. It's kind of like a. Uh, Thai green curry take on quinoa, basically. So there's a nice green curry sauce with some uh, spiced cashews and cilantro, micro cilantro on top. And, you know, they just they just warm it in a pan on top of the stovetop uh, right before it's served. So it goes out and it, it's not cold. It, it's warm, which, uh, you know, during the wintertime, it's a little bit more hearty and a little bit more warming and, uh, you know, more satisfying to me. So, And I guess it, um, you... Like before we even got our drinks, I think you came over and you like kneeled down next to the table and you're like, all right, let's make a deal, guys. And you asked us to move to the other table in exchange for a free dessert. And honestly, Brian, I really appreciate the dessert and I would have moved without a free dessert. But what was that thing? It was, I remember it was described as it looks like a creme brulee, but I think it had pumpkin in it. Yeah, that was a uh, pumpkin peau de creme. Um so it, it 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 is soft like a creme brulee. Um, it, it's almost uh, pot de creme is kind of a fancy way of saying pudding, basically. But uh, so it's a roasted pumpkin pot de creme um, with some uh, salted uh, roasted pumpkin seeds and salted caramel on top. Um, we've done a couple of pot de cremes now. Um, the last one we did was a vanilla bourbon pot de creme, which is fantastic too. But it's just a really nice, soft, easy dessert um, that's not too heavy and too filling, but still definitely satisfies that sweet tooth and that, that sugar urge after dinner, for sure. Totally. And thanks again for that free dessert. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you moving. You know, that's 
that's one of the things about this place. It's a very small um, a brew pub, so when we get crowded, uh, you know, I, I, sometimes we have to ask people to, to to move around. It doesn't happen often, but occasionally, you know, I figure if I offer a free beer or dessert, people are usually pretty willing to do it. And that's, you know, it just goes to speak, I think, of the community of, of the brewing industry and the people who come into breweries. I don't, you know, I don't feel it's very pretentious or stuck up. I feel like if you just approach people like people and you talk to them and you're like, hey, you know, um, we kind of need this to happen. You know, if you'd be willing to do this, I'll do something for you. And people are usually very responsive to that if you treat them like people, you know, and uh, just are, are, are kind to other people. They're, they're kind back. So it's it's been a really good experience in this place, actually. We have, we have a great, great clientele, which uh, you're now part of. So thank you. Yeah, for sure. Well, you and my uh, returning customers, customer support, I'm gonna, definitely going to be coming back. So awesome. I don't want to leave the beer as as a as a sideshow. The beer is really good too, and I had the yeah. uh, tasting flight that night. I'd have to check my untapped check-ins. I don't remember <laughs> exactly what I had or what I liked the most, but there was a wide variety, and it's pretty good. Tell me a little bit about the beers that you guys got going on. So uh, David Goodstall is the name of our head brewer. Um, he went to the UC Davis uh, fermentation sciences program. He's been a professional brewer for over 10 years now. But um, he focuses a lot on uh, very traditional German and English-style beers. Um, so that's, that's basically what we do. We're a very small brew pub. Um, we have a seven-barrel system. Uh, we have four fermentation vessels and six bright tanks. Um, so we... In that aspect, we're somewhat limited to what we can do with our beer. Um, you know, we're not going to throw in a whole bunch of uh, different yeast strains and a whole bunch of bacteria to turn our beer sour just because it's such a small quarters and there's a lot of contamination issues and things like that. So uh, we do the best we can with the space we have. And, um, you know, I, with that said, I mean, each beer that we make has the potential to be great. And uh, I think Dave does a really good job. Um, our best-selling beer is called the East Bay IPA, um, pretty traditional West Coast-style IPA. Uh, but we've we've done everything from uh, Scotch ales to Kolsch's to IPAs to a couple different kinds of stouts to reds and browns. Um, so we we've we've probably made about fifteen to twenty different styles of beer in the three years that we've been open. Um, and and Dave and Ben, our assistant brewer, they do they do a really good job with what we have and. Uh, you know, they make deep beer that's that's drinkable um, every day. You know, it's, it's it, like I said, it's a very local place. We have a group of 15, 20, 30 people that come in four to five times a week. So we want to make beer that they can drink every day. Um, and, you know, so we we experiment and we do really big beers and, and pretty exotic, strange, uh, very flavorful beers, but then we also do very traditional beers that you can drink a couple of every day and not get sick of. And, and uh, they're, they, they've done a great job with the beer so far, so uh, I'm very happy with that. Thanks for broadening the picture about your brew pub. Now let's get focused a bit. I have some questions I'm going to give you, and I like to go real deep, real fast. Are you okay with that, Brian? Yeah, let's do it. Tell me the biggest mistake you ever made as a brewery owner. Um, so let's see here. Um, there's, there's a couple, I mean, uh, I think first, uh, you know, when, when I thought about opening a brew pub, it was, you know, I, I know the restaurant industry, I know beer. Um, you know, I think the two of us can really, can really put something good together. And, um, you know, as far as beer and food concern is concerned, you know, we had that, you know, we, we understood that part of the industry and we really had that down, but, um, there's just a lot of laws and regulations um, that go into owning a brew pub that, uh, you know, unless you, you've, you've owned a brew pub, you can't really be familiar with them. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a couple stumbling blocks we had as, as far as, you know, making sure our employees got proper breaks and uh, things like that. Just um, understanding the laws and the regulations of your district and your state is, is crucial. So you don't get yourself into trouble. You know, um, one of the main priorities we have when we open this place was that we, you know, we want to be a place that treats our employees well. I mean, we, we offer them health insurance. We're setting up a 401k for our employees right now. Um, we, 
you know, we, we try and treat our employees really well. Um, but you know, there's, there's a lot of laws that even if your employees are happy, you know, what the law states is, is a little bit different than what you might know. So you really want to, you really want to make sure that you know all those laws so you don't run into any problems down the road. Um, luckily there's no major issues for us, but there's, there's some things that we found out that we weren't aware of that we had to work on. Um, how did you find out about that or how was it brought to your attention? How do you go about looking into that? Uh, so you, you can go to the labor board or the board of equalization. Um, they will have all kinds of information for you to read. And I mean, I'm talking hundreds of pages of information of really dry material that might not be very fun to read through. But, uh, I think it's important that you actually sit down and, and learn those laws and, and really understand what you're getting yourself into and, and what kind of, uh, what kind of guidelines you have to go by. Um, so there's, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, uh, like I said, the, the labor board, the board of equalization, um, there's a lot of resources out there. You just have to be proactive and in, in going out and learning all that stuff before you find yourself in a sticky situation pretty much. Um, so that's incredibly important. Um, and then personally, I think also, you know, I, I was 31 years old when we first opened this place and, uh, you know, it's a brewery and it's a restaurant and it's a lot of fun. It's a really fun environment. And, um, it's, it's easy to get, you know, you work so many hours, you work 14, 16 hour days, six, seven days a week. Um, it's easy to get caught up in the, in the exciting aspect and drink a lot of beer and, uh, you know, just have a good time. But, um, you know, you really want to harness yourself in as well. Um, or I did anyway, and, uh, understand that this is a profession and, uh, try and be as professional as possible. Um, cause you know, the whole time you're out there it, when you're a restaurant and you're a brewery, it's a very public atmosphere. And, uh, you know, w- what you display as yourself is, is what represents the brew pub and what represents your business. So, uh, really focusing on that and making sure you're being professional at all time and not having too much fun. Um, and I'm all for fun, trust me. Um, but you know, really being professional, um, at all, at all times is, is incredibly important. So, so those would be the, the two major mistakes that I would say, um, and also maybe just just understanding that you can't do everything on your own and that you need help and that you need uh, a good staff to help you out. Uh, on our opening night, me and my business partner thought we could run the entire building ourselves. And, uh, you know, I literally had friends putting on aprons because we were so swamped. And it was just, you know, after that, you step back and you're like, okay, you know, we're going to need some help here. And uh, oh, that's, wow. that's okay. That's a good thing. You know, um, if you don't need help, then that's, that's probably a problem. But, um, you know, uh, understanding that you can't do everything on your own and that, uh, you need people to work with you and, and you need to be able to trust in people. Um, because if you trust in your staff and you're willing to put a little bit more responsibility into your staff, then, you know, it makes them happy. It makes them feel good. And it also, you're, it, it's good for the business because you're not as tired. You're not as worn out. Your, your energy's higher, your mood's better. Um, so I think there's, there's, there's a definite benefit to understanding that and uh, really, really being able to trust in that. If you were going to start your brewery over again, what would you do differently to do it better? So I guess one thing that I would do, um, we are, you know, like I said, we're a seven barrel brewing system. Um, it, it's small. We, we almost run out of beer. We have a 60 person restaurant and we almost run out of beer in here. Um, we're constantly fighting to keep up with the demand in this restaurant. And, uh, wow, even it, just for the beer sold on premise. Yeah. We don't sell beer outside of here. It's just for the beer sold on premise. Um, but you know, it's, it's sometimes it's like, you know, our, our IPA, it takes two weeks to ferment at least, and it sells in a week and a half, you know, so we really gotta be, have a batch of that going at all times pretty much. And, you know, so one thing I would do is I go bigger, honestly. Um, I, in hindsight, I think a 10 barrel system would have been way better for us. Uh, we'd be able to sell growlers at that point. We might be able to sell some kegs to, you know, bars and get some taps around the Bay area. Um, so I think going bigger, uh, would have been something that in hindsight I would have done. And, you know, if, if, if you have a strong business plan and you have a strong location and you really feel like, you know, this is going to be, 
something that's going to succeed. Um, I, I think don't doubt that, you know, and, and try and go a little bit bigger. Um, I know obviously the finances, everybody's on a budget, um, and they're just trying to get their doors open. Um, and a bigger system means more money, but, um, if that's at all accessible, um, which to us, it probably would have, you know, it would have been, we would have had to search a little bit more to get a little bit more financing, but I think we could have done it. And, uh, you know, that would, that would be something that I, I really would have liked to have done, um, would just be, you know, get a bigger system, get some more beer out there, you know, um, seven barrels is not a lot of beer. So, um, that for us, um, that would have been something that I would have done differently. Do you have plans to expand? Um, we do and we don't. That's that, We do. I mean, we've talked about it and we would love to. Um, we actually just finished paying off our major investor um earlier this year so we're we're out of debt um nice congratulations three years thank you that was that was that was pretty huge you know it took us two and a half years to get there um but we expected it to take a little bit longer so we're ahead of the game um as far as that's concerned and um we would like to expand uh the beer the craft beer industry right now is is booming. It's such a saturated market, especially in places like the Bay Area, that um, it's something that's going to take a lot of thought for us, whether it's, uh, you know, we want to open another brew pub and another restaurant and, and have another brewery there, or, you know, if we wanted to open uh, just a, a straight packaging brewery and, and, and start to sell kegs and bottles and stuff like that. Um, that's That's something that we're trying to work out right now. You know, I'm actually kind of in the process of writing business plans for both of those options and uh, thinking thinking about what would be best for us. Um, but we also want to do it as organically as possible, you know, um, and we don't want to rush things. We don't want to get in over our head. Um, we want to really, really feel it out and make sure we're comfortable with what we're doing and, uh, you know, go from there. So there are plans, um, but there's, it's not going to happen tomorrow. That's for sure. Um, we're, we're right now very happy with, with what we've got going on. And, um, we're going to, we're, we're going to look to grow, but we're going to look to grow in, uh, in, like I said, an organic and sustainable fashion. That's not going to get us in over our heads. Some, some of the microbrewer listeners have asked for resources for writing a business plan. Since you're in the process of that right now, can you offer any resources to help somebody write a business plan for a brewery? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, well, you know, there's, there's one book out there, um, that I would definitely recommend. It's called the Brewers Association's Guide to Opening a Brewery. Um, it's written by Dick Cantwell. And, um, that's a phenomenal resource. It, it was for me as, as far as, um, they really cover a lot of areas on, on, uh, as far as beer, as far as, uh, legalities, as far as writing a business plan and what that takes, um, you know, so that's that's a really good book. When I, I use it all the time when I was writing my business plan, and um, it, it helped me a lot. Um, the other thing I did, honestly, was I just went online and I read a bunch of other business plans. I just read other people's plans, and you know, I, I went to business school, so I had a I had a, a an understanding of what a business plan entailed. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I just went online and read other people's and, and got a feel for the flow of it and what they're really trying to accomplish with writing a business plan. And that's as simple as Google, really. I mean, the Internet's a vast, vast resource for a lot of different things. Um, so, um, you know, we wrote what I feel is a pretty solid business plan. Um, you know, we we overestimated on our costs and we underestimated on our revenue and we were able to find something with those estimations that was sustainable and that's worst case scenario. And then you come in and your costs are lower and your revenue is higher and you're, you're doing good. So, um, that's, that's an important, an important part of writing a business plan. I think it's nice to do better than expected. Yeah, it sure is. You know, and, and, and that's, a, that's the whole purpose of a business plan to me is, you know, it's like, well, let's be realistic. And what's the worst case scenario? And if that does happen, can we still make this work? You know, and and it's very it's it's very logical, really. It's you know, if 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 these are our costs and these are our revenues, can we make this work still? You know, and uh, if you can, if you figure out a way, you know, you figure out all your costs and you can make it work, um, and then you know you do better than that, then that's that's golden. You know, so. Um, yeah, that's that's important. Um, there's a lot of fluff, I think, in business plans sometimes, but I, 
I think the the base of it is let's find a plan that's actually going to work for us, you know, and, and be realistic with yourself and be honest and um, figure it out, you know. So Google business plans to look at examples, maybe take a class at like a local community college on business. Uh, yeah, that would help. Um, certainly, uh, that, that would definitely help. I, I got my degree at San Francisco state in marketing, which wasn't necessarily focused on, uh, business plans by any means, but, uh, you know, I took a couple classes that definitely, um, that focused on business plans. Um, yeah. And also th- that book, the, uh, Brewers Association Guide to Opening a Brewery, um, by Dick Cantwell is a really good resource as well. Some other, uh, guests of the podcast have mentioned that one also, but I didn't realize that it covered business plans also. So listeners, if you want to check that out, you can go to microbrewer.com slash book list. And it's one of the top ones that have been mentioned so far. Nice. So let's go to the other side of the spectrum, Brian. What's the best idea you've ever had for your business? Oh, oh, uh, starting it, <laughs> I'm going for it, just doing it was was big. But uh, I think one of the main things, you know, we're we're a brew pub. Um, we focus on beer. We also have food. We're a very we're one of the more family friendly breweries I've ever been to in my life. And I think a major reason for that is our food. Um, and we're in, we're in a very, you know, it's, it's a small town. It's El Cerrito. It's a suburb of Oakland and San Francisco. And, uh, you know, we get a lot of people in here, um, to eat as well as to drink the beer. Um, and we're, when we were initially opening, uh, our initial idea was that we were going to have a mill and we were just going to have a very small kitchen that consisted of salads and paninis and maybe, you know, uh, some snacks and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, cause we're, we're very limited with space. We didn't have the option for both a mill and a kitchen. So we were, we we're going to do the mill and just some like paninis and, and salads. And, um, you know, about halfway, into the design process of the building. Um, uh, I thought to myself, I was like, you know, I just, I really think this is going to be a restaurant as well. Um, and, uh, we need a full size kitchen and, um, we need a full scale kitchen with a full menu. Um, so we kind of reworked everything. Um, and it was initially a little bit more expensive to build obviously a full kitchen. Um, and it was to have a salad and panini station. Um, but that has turned out to be one of the better ideas that we had for this place. Um, it was, you know, our, our food's really taken off. People come in here to eat all the time. Um, and without our kitchen, I don't, I don't know if this place would be nearly as successful. You know, with salads and paninis is nothing like the food we put out right now. So, um, that was, that was a pretty, pretty key factor for us, I think, um, in, in opening. How far along in the process were you when you changed that design? Did you already have the location set? We had the location set. Yeah, we were. We were, I'd finished writing the business plan. I had to go back and rewrite the business plan. Um, we had had a location picked out. We were we were pretty deep into the process. We were almost about to start construction. Actually, I mean, we were we were very close to starting construction and to signing our lease, and then we decided to switch that up and change it around. And um, it, it's it's definitely been been for the better so you must have had some padding in the budget uh we did have a little bit of padding in the budget absolutely um you know the whole the mill station and everything i mean we took that out of the equation so that saved us a little bit of money but building the kitchen definitely cost you know a few extra thousand dollars than than what we had uh originally anticipated but uh you know, I, I think it's 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 crucial to have padding in the budget too. You know, I mean, you're going to need more money than you ever think you're going to need initially, um, and that's uh, it, it's it's crucial to have a little bit little bit of padding in the budget. I think for sure. Yeah. Another an, another important uh, aspect for us was just location, and I know people say location, location, location for business all the time, but. Uh, that was really that was definitely important for us. Uh, we looked in San Francisco, we looked in Oakland, we looked in Berkeley, we even looked in San Rafael, um, at, at all these different locations to open a brew pub. And um, you know, we chose El Cerrito for a couple reasons. Um, one, because it's a you know, doing all the demographic research, I, I learned that the age in this town is dropping a lot. It's not, you know, as much of an older community. There's a lot of young people uh, my age, their late 20s, early 30s, 
um, moving into El Cerrito, um, and there wasn't much here. You know, there's not. We're right next to a movie theater, um, but there's not really a whole lot in El Cerrito. So um, we were kind of uh, the first to come into El Cerrito and produce something that we thought was somewhat hip and uh, had good food and had good beer. And um, so location was definitely huge for us as well. You mentioned lots of great moments from having to recruit friends on opening night. And and I'm wondering if there's a, a moment that you realized you finally succeeded. Um, you know, I, I, th- I think for us, and yeah, I think my business partners would agree, um, after opening night, you know, at the very end of opening night, um, there was a moment where, you know, we just... I don't know who initiated this or what happened, but uh, all the kitchen staff, all the owners, everybody who was working that night, we all just kind of came out behind the bar and everybody started applauding us, you know, and uh, we all just kind of hugged each other and, you know, everybody started applauding us and they're taking our pictures. It was, it was crazy. But at that moment, you know, it was like, wow, you know, I've been working on opening. Uh, this is the first business I'd ever opened. So it took us a while to get open. I've been working on it for about a year and a half. Um, before we actually got the doors open. So at that point, with that complete full house and people being incredibly happy and raving about the food and raving about the beer and giving us that round of applause, that was a, that was a really special moment for me. Um, you know, I don't know if it was necessarily that I knew I had succeeded. I knew, I knew we had a long road ahead of us, but I knew that we had, we'd, we'd accomplished one goal, and that was getting this place open. And um, I think all of us kind of had the feeling that if we got the doors open, um, that we would work hard enough and we would we were smart enough and, and hardworking enough to be able to keep it going and, and maintain it. Um, so that was that was definitely a, a huge moment for us. And I, I know my business partners feel the same way. We still have those pictures hanging in our office, and I look at it every day, and I, you know I, I just think, wow, you know this is this is amazing. I I remember working on this so hard and you know it literally started off as us drawing out images on bar napkins and and writing ideas down on bar napkins and then i got a computer and we started uh, i had a computer but i put this stuff onto a computer and then you know we were like let's just go with it and we just kept going and uh you know eventually a year and a half later we actually had a brewery um so uh that was that was a really i i definitely felt like i had succeeded in something at that moment and uh it was a great feeling it was a great feeling that's pretty cool that's actually i my next question would be what's your favorite memory since opening the brewery but that sounds like it's maybe going to be the answer that that would probably be the answer um to that would would be that um yeah we also yeah we also recently had a three-year anniversary party, and uh, we shut down the restaurant, and we had an employee appreciation party that day, and um, that was a lot of fun for us, too, because, you know, we still have people that have been here since our first day, um, which for a brew pub is pretty rare. I think there's a lot of turnover in restaurants, but um, we have people that have been here with us for three years, and just kind of going back and recalling all the memories um, since we've been open and you know we had, we had a great time we drank a lot of beer we barbecued um, we did fun stuff and uh, you know everybody laughed and had a good time and it was it was nice to get away from work you know and have everybody who works here be able to get together outside of work and just kind of relax and have a good time so um, those are those are two of my, my best memories since we've been open for sure Hey, that makes me think a lot of people talk about the high turnover rate. Like you don't need to pay employees in this business too much because there's going to be a high turnover any anyway. And I kind of feel like if you pay your employees a livable wage, they're going to be giving good customer service, which is going to pay off in so many ways, building relationships with your customers and whatnot. Can you talk a little bit about what you do to keep your customers so, I mean, keep your employees so long and like the pros and cons of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that's 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 true. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, you, you don't have unlimited money, obviously, but I think you know, I mean, you treat your employees well. You know, they they work hard for you. Uh, you know, you give them a raise every every couple of months, and you know, you you definitely pay them a livable wage. Um, that's I I think that should be basic for any any business. Uh, I think that's just you know, humanity, really. It's not even to keep employees or to do anything like that. That's just, you know, doing what's right, um, I think. But, uh, 
You know, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, a, a happy employee is definitely a more productive employee. And, um, you know, uh, our, our customers get to developing relationships with our employees around here, you know, so it's, it's, it's something, you know, it's, it's a very big family basically is kind of how I look at it. And we want to try and keep everybody happy. You know I mean? We're a small business, you know, we offer insurance to all of our employees, um, health insurance, um, you know, we're, we're actually in the process right now of setting up 401k plans for the owners and for the employees and every employee will have the opportunity to get a 401k plan. Um, so there's those things that are very standard that that's kind of the, the cookie cutter. If you want to be a good owner and, and, and treat your employees well, like these are the things you do, you know, you offer them health insurance, you set up a 401k, you pay them a livable wage. Um, but I think also it, it just comes down to, to respecting their part in, in the business, you know, and this is a, it's a, a machine that has multiple different parts and you treat all your employees with respect and you, you kind of try and uh, for us anyway, I guess there's two different styles of management for us. I think we kind of try and uh, eliminate any kind of hierarchy, you know, and we, we all kind of do this together. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's something that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think the employees feel more comfortable with us that way. Um, you know, I think they're, my, they're, you know, they're my friends, but they also, they respect what I have to say, um, as, as, as far as the bottom line in the restaurant goes, um, but that's that's because I respect what they say, and I I really do take what they have to say and their input to heart, you know, because they're here working every day. They see just as much as I do, and uh, you know, I mean, having multiple perspectives on how to run this business is invaluable, you know. So I think I think logically, you want to you want to be open minded and and really trust and listen to your employees, and uh, you know, if they have an issue, I, I certainly hope. And I, I, I believe that they, they feel they can come up to me and talk to me and I'll, I'll listen to them with an open heart and, you know, I'll try and give them the best advice or just listen or help them in any way that I can. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's just like I said, I mean, we try and, we try and take this and treat this as a family basically, and just be good to each other, you know? Um, and also we give them free beer and free food. So that helps as well. <laughs> So what could you tell an aspiring home brewer, somebody who's still thinking about, just has a dream of starting a brew pub, what's the most important thing for someone to start doing tomorrow? Um, I, I would say um, start looking into the red tape. Um, you know, for us, uh, the the ABC and the Tax and Trade Bureau, these these permits that you have to get and all this red tape that you have to go through, can be a long and arduous process and um you know i you really want to um have have a uh, a solid plan of attack on how you're going to do all those things because i really didn't know much about it and i was trying to do all these things at once meanwhile signing a lease and and, and paying money on a lease that i couldn't start construction on yet because they didn't have permits for this or this or this so we we lost the money in that way um, so I think really, you know, the tax and trade bureau is a big one. Um, there's a, that's, that's the federal agency that you're going to get, um, a lot of your operating permits through. Um, and you have to have a very concise business plan that really, uh, answers all of their questions. Um, so to do that, you basically get in touch with the tax and trade bureau and you tell them, you know, I'm thinking about opening a brew pub. I'd like to know exactly what I'm going to need to do in order to get all the permits that I need from you. And you just start working on those one by one and just check them off the checklist. Um, cause you know, uh, 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 brewing beer is amazing and it's, it, it's an amazing passion and people who love to do that, that want to open a microbrewery, you know, that that's amazing and, and go for that. But there's, there's all that stuff that's not so fun and that you're not passionate about that you're going to have to, that you're going to have to deal with to, to get it open. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, just, uh, getting through all that red tape and understanding what the red tape entails, um, is important because otherwise you're going to find yourself just, just shelling out money for no reason and, uh, wasting a lot of your time when, when you could do it in a really efficient manner, pretty much. Just start planning, dig in and look into it. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Now we have a question from one of our listeners, Hayden Little, who asks, how much trouble did you have coming up with a name and what was the inspiration for the name? 
we we didn't have a whole lot of trouble. Um, we actually originally were going to be called the Original Gravity Brewery, um, and uh, that was what we had had gone with. We were going to be the Original Gravity Brewery. Um, uh, however, when we proposed that name to the Tax and Trade Bureau, um, we learned that there was already a brew pub or something, and I believe it was in the state of Michigan, um, that was called the Original Gravity Brewery. <laughs> um, so we had to change that. Um, that was already that was already coined. That was already theirs. So um, that wasn't very creative or original, I suppose. So we had to come up with something else. Um, so at that point, we started thinking of local, um, you know, uh, something local that's not going to be taken by somebody else throughout the country. Um, so we uh, realized that the elevation, overall elevation of the town of El Cerrito is 66 feet above sea level, and elevation 66 just kind of had a ring to it. Uh, we knew there was no other businesses in El Cerrito called Elevation 66, and uh, so that's what we went with. Um, and it's it's kind of a fun name, you know. Uh, but it, I, I don't know if there's a lot of trouble involved, um, but it you know a good name is important. Um, so we just we just decided to go with things that were local and that pertain to the city that we were in, and um, do it that way. All right, now it's time for happy hour, Brian. The next set of questions are a little lighter. We're going to get to know each other a little better and have some fun and get inside the industry. Are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. Cans or bottles? Uh, cans. Would you like me to elaborate? <laughs> well, you seemed kind of uncertain about that. No, I, I cans. Um, I, I would say cans. Uh, you know, you can't get light struck, um, longer shelf life, more environmentally friendly. Um, you know, I, I think cans are the better way to go. Um, if you can't stand the taste of the aluminum, then pour your can into a glass. Um, also more efficient for things like camping and you know, they're much more easy to travel with, um, and, uh, less chance of breaking them. So yeah, cans. And you're not the brewer for your business, but you've done some brewing. What's the most challenging beer that you've ever made? Oh, the most challenging beer that I've ever made. Um, honestly, the most challenging beer I've ever made um, would probably be a Scotch Ale that I did at my house. Um, I uh, just really had trouble um, getting the yeast to ferment all that sugar out of the beer. Um, it just wasn't activating for me properly. Um, and, you know, this was, I guess, this is probably the second, third beer I ever tried to make. Um, and this is a, a home brewer. Um, but the yeast just wasn't activating properly, and I, I, I couldn't get it to work. Um, so I, I basically ended up with a beer that was well under-fermented with way too much residual sugar, and uh, a scotch ale. It was supposed to be a wee heavy that would have been around 9%, 10%. Um, that ended up coming out probably around 5.5%. Um, and that just did not taste very good at all. Um, so, And also, uh, you know, the first beer that we made on this brewing system that we have here, um, the first batch I made was uh, called Esther Stout. I made that with Dave. And that was a lot of fun um, because it was a brand new system that none of us had ever worked with before. Um, but just, you know, the challenge of, of learning, you know, how to actually work the system and the ins and, out, and, ins and outs of that um, was a lot of fun. Um, and at this point, you know, Ben and Dave, our head brewers, had that down to a, a science. But uh, that, was, that was a lot of fun, but it was uh, also challenging because I'd never used this system before. If you're going to make a five-gallon batch at home this weekend, what beer would you make? Mm, if I was going to make a five-gallon batch at home this weekend, I would probably just make a IPA. Um, that's honestly what I drink for the most part. Um, I, I, I drink a lot of other beers, I guess, occasionally. Um, I, I, if something sounds interesting that I have not tried, I'll try it. If I'm eating food, then I'll pair a different beer with some other kind of food. But... Um, I, I love IPAs. I love traditional West Coast style IPAs with a lot of uh, Cascade hops, um, just grapefruit, good hops. Um, so that would that would be what I would go for. Tell me one beer style that you think will be gaining more attention. Um, uh, let's see here. I would probably say. Um, 
I mean, I think sour beers are going to be gaining attention for a while to come. I know they've been pretty popular um, for the past couple of years, and they've been growing. But, uh, it, you know, I think I think beer is becoming so popular and so uh, uh, trendy right now, and it's it's really um, it, it's growing uh, rapidly, and uh, people don't really know too much about sour. So I think that would be something that that'll definitely continue to grow. Um, also, Gosa's uh, is you know I I'd never had one of these beers until uh, last year. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing a couple different uh, breweries that are that are producing Gosas. Um, we have Anderson Valley's on tap right now, and it's really unique beer. I don't believe it's actually classified as a sour beer, although I could be wrong about that. But it's got an incredibly tart, citric, sour flavor to it, um, and it it it, it, uh, it has a salty finish. I mean, it almost tastes like you're licking a salt lick at the end. So it's one of the more interesting beers that I've ever tried. It's a really old style of German beer that's been made for over a thousand years, I know, but kind of disappeared for a little while. Um, and it's definitely making a comeback. I mean, if it's making a comeback in, in the United States, I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure it probably is in Germany as well. Um, but that'll be, that'll be a beer I think we see more of just because how unique they are. Um, I mean, you don't really usually get very many salty and sour beers at once. So, that's a that's a fun style that I dig a lot, and I I hope we see more of for sure. What is that called? It's a Gosa. Uh, it's G O S E, and then it's uh, it's not a goose, not G E U Z E. It's G O S E E, and I I'm pretty sure it's pronounced Gosa. I haven't heard of that one before. Can you suggest a book for our audience that will help them succeed in opening a brewery? You mentioned Dick Cantwell's book. Yeah, uh, Rick Cantwell's book, The Brewers Association Guide to Opening a Brewery, is is a great one. Um, that's that's got it's a wealth of knowledge. Um, the Brewers Association obviously knows the craft beer industry very well, so that's that's definitely the first one I would go to. Um, also, if you haven't read it, um, the Oxford Companion to Beer, um, which is edited by Garrett Oliver of the Brooklyn Brewing Company. Um, that beer is that that book is fantastic. Um, I mean, that it's to me, it's like the Bible of beer. I mean, it just covers everything. It, maybe not as much on the business side, but you really need to know beer and know your product. And uh, I mean, it's everything from the science of beer to the traditions and the history of styles and uh, pairing food and beer. Um, it's just an incredible, incredible book. I, I have it on my coffee table at home, and you know, when I don't have anything to do, I I just pick it up and read through it. I mean, it's gosh, it's got to be fifteen hundred pages or so um, of, of small print. So there's a lot of information in that book, and it's it's one of my favorite. It's my favorite beer book of all time. So nice. That was mentioned one time before, so it's going to move it up on the list a little bit. Listeners, if you want to check that out, it's at microbrewer.com slash booklist. So, Brian, before we go, tell me one thing that you're really excited about right now. Uh, one thing I'm really excited about. Um, so, sustainability is a big thing for us. Um, we, you know, we our bar is built out of old recycled and reclaimed redwood. Our The bricks holding up our bar is an old mansion from Oakland that was torn down in the early uh, 1900s. Um, so, you know, uh, the sustainability is a big thing for us, but I recently um, was in touch with uh, True Market Solutions is what it's called, but a uh, really nice guy came in and he's trying to do uh, what's called a sustainability circle um, in the city of El Cerrito, where they basically get, I think it's eight to ten businesses together, and um, this this company basically works with each of our businesses individually to try and help us and uh you know, figure out ways that we can be more sustainable. Um, I'm also trying to become a certified green business in the state of California. That was one of my goals when we opened. Um, I've been incredibly busy working 80 hours, 70, 80 hours a week since we opened. So um, I've kind of put that a little bit on the back burner, 
But uh, within the past six months, I've been able to take a little bit more time off. Um, so that's something that I'm going to start focusing on is uh, actually becoming a certified green business in the state of California. And uh, you know, just uh, every day, thing, figuring out things that we can do to become more sustainable, um, definitely one of the values we have here and um, something we want to continue to work on and not be complacent with. Um, so that that's something I'm very excited about uh, moving forward, and and also the possibility of expansion. You know, um, that's it's exciting. It's it's uh, some that you know. Do I want to get into that right now? But you know, um, it it is exciting, and it's something that that we're gonna uh, look for and uh, work on, so we can you know get some beer out to more people, and that's that's really the goal here. You know, um, we want to be able to. I, I think Dave and Ben make some of the best beer we. We have in the Bay Area, honestly. I mean, and I know there's a ton of it, but I'm, and I know I might be partial, but I think their beer is fantastic, clean, delicious beer, and uh, we want to get that out to more people. So, well, I'm looking forward to see what the future holds for Elevation 66. Give us one last piece of advice for someone who just brewed the first batch at their new brewery, and then we'll close up the brew house for the night. Uh. <laughs> Sit down and enjoy a pint of beer and, uh, you know, just take some time to reflect on everything you've done. Be happy for yourself. Be proud of yourself. Uh, be confident going forward and uh, in, enjoy that beer. Um, that's, that's basically it. Well, thanks for taking the time, Brian. I appreciate it. Thanks for sharing your tips on starting and operating a successful brewery. Congratulations on your three-year mark. So tell us how we can stay in touch with you, and then we'll set this episode aside to ferment. Uh, you can stay in touch with us. Uh, you can look up Elevation 66 Brewing Company on Facebook, or you can shoot me an email at brian, B-R-I-A-N dot Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y at elevation66.com. Um, either way, we'd love to hear from you. And thank you, Nathan. I definitely appreciate this opportunity. Thanks again, Brian Kelly, for being on Microbrewer Podcast. Thanks for sharing your stories and your advice about starting and operating a successful brewery. Listeners, I want to encourage you to check out the show notes for the books and other resources that we talked about in this episode. Please go to the show notes and get in touch with Brian and thank him for being on the show. You can find links to get in touch with Brian Kelly and Elevation 66 Brewing Company at microbrewer.com slash session 36. And don't forget to check out microbrewer.com slash support microbrewer and see how you can support microbrewer podcast and the microbrewer website that's at microbrewer.com slash support microbrewer thanks a lot thank you very much for doing that i appreciate that and by the way one way that you could support the show is to leave a review in itunes there were a couple new reviews in itunes g marshall 82 said Nathan's doing a good job of getting inside the brewing industry. A wide variety of guests provide useful insight and helpful advice for starting a brewery. And Rhea Windcaller said, Can't wait to tell my brewing friends and wannabe microbrewers about this podcast. Fun. Excellent questions. This podcast is getting our craft beer history archived. Hey, that's pretty neat. That's a really neat way of looking at that. So send me a message anytime, guys. You can reach me through email, uh, through the forum on the webpage, microbrewer.com slash contact. Or you can tweet at me on Twitter at microbrewer and Facebook at microbrewer. And I'm on untapped at Nathan Pierce. So you can send me a friend request and I'll check out what you're drinking and give the toast to the ones I like. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, support your local brewery, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to Micro Brewer Podcast with Nathan Pierce. We'll see you right here next time at microbrewer.com. If you want more resources for starting a craft brewery, check out microbrewer.com, M-I-C-R-O-B-R-E-W-R.com. If you want to become a Cicerone certified beer server, check out beerexamschool.com for free study guide and flashcards for the certified beer server exam, beerexamschool.com.